invite you to turn in your own personal Bibles or the Pew Bible to Paul's second letter to Timothy, chapter 4. being poured out as drink offering, the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. If you took a foreign language in high school or in college, you undoubtedly had to conjugate verbs. In seminary, it was required that every student take a minimum of two semesters of Biblical Greek in order to, for us to be able to find a way around the New Testament in the language in which it was originally written. We had to memorize the conjugation table. The first verb we learned was the verb luo, because it was regular, most regular verb. It followed the rules, and therefore was the standard. So every future minister in the first week of class had to memorize the present active indicative of luo. Luo, luais. Lumen, Luite, Lucy. <laughs> I still remember it. Dr. Culpepper would be proud of me. But if you asked me for the aorist passive subjunctive form, I could not tell you to save my life. It so happens that the definition of that simplest verb, three letters in Greek, that we all learned, all ministers learned, contains one of the most important concepts in the spiritual life. It means to loose or to let go. If one learns to let go, one has learned a great truth. A man was hiking up a mountain, he lost his footing, and he tumbled off a steep cliff. He managed as he was going down to grab on to a root sticking out from the side of the mountain, and he hung there. He could not go up. And below him was a 300 foot drop and certain death. He had been hiking alone. He had seen no one on the trail for hours, so he thought for sure he was a goner. And just as he thought he could hold on no longer, he heard a voice from above call him. Dave. Dave replied, yes, yes, there's someone up there. Yes, there is. I'm here. Well, help me. Of course I'll help you, Dave. Who is this? How do you know my name? Well, it's me, God. God? Yes, God. I'm here to help you. You do believe in me, Dave, don't you? Oh, yes, God. Throw me a rope. <laughs> no, Dave, I am God. I don't need a rope to save you. Just let go of the root, and I will catch you. Dave was silent for a moment. Finally, God said, Dave... You do believe in me, don't you? Mm hmm. Yes, replied Dave. Then just let go and I will catch you. Dave thought for a moment and then he yelled out, Is there anyone else up there? <laughs> My message this morning is about letting go. First, to let go of our worries and fears. Jesus said that passage that was read this morning from the Sermon on the Mount. Do not worry. In other translations we we'll use the words, do not be anxious. This is easier said than done. Jesus says in here not to worry about our life, not to worry about food, not to worry about body, not to even to worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow will take care of itself. Then he adds, can any of you by worrying can add a single hour to his life? My wife and I had a conversation while traveling in the car the other day. Jude said she was a bit worried about our kids. I said, I don't worry about our kids. 
She said, I know, you can stand to worry about them a little bit more than you do. <laughs> now, I'm not saying I don't worry. I just don't worry about my grown kids. I figure I did my job by getting them into adulthood in one piece. Now they're on their own. And their, kid, their kids are their worry, not mine. Jesus is telling us not to worry, to let go, to loosen up. The primal sin of human nature, you could call it the original sin if you want to use that term, is that we hold so tightly to everything in our lives rather than letting it go, and giving it to God. Worry is really nothing more than fear when you think about it. When we worry, we are afraid of what might happen or what might not happen. A lot of the anguish and emotional suffering of life stems from our inability to let go of this fear and worry and anxiety. Second, let go of sin. Here I'm talking about forgiveness. The Greek word for forgive means literally to let go. It is the image of a clenched fist which is relaxed. Forgiveness is the centerpiece of biblical religion. All the different religions of the world defines what they see as the essential problem of human existence, and they each propose a solution. The Judeo-Christian tradition defines the root problem as sin, and the solution as forgiveness. There is a human need to be forgiven and to forgive. But people have a real problem with forgiveness. People have a problem with guilt and with sin. They might not be comfortable using those exact words, but they'll talk about somebody who did something wrong to them or others. They'll express anger or a sense of injustice or resentment, and they will not let go of that sense of being wronged. And some people will remember a wrong that had been done for years, their lives and relationships are governed, perhaps for decades, for something that happened long ago. Or it might have been something that they have done, and they have not felt like they've been forgiven, nor can they forgive themselves. So they carry guilt around with them, which poisons their hearts. The genius of the gospel of Christ is that we can be freed from this. We can be loosed. We can let go of the past and be set free from it. And that forgiveness, the Gospel says, is found in Christ. Through faith in Christ, we can experience forgiveness for what we have done, and we can also receive the ability to be able to forgive others no matter what they have done to us. It is possible to forgive and forget. I've heard people, and I'm sure you have heard people, say that they can forgive, but they will never forget. If that is the case, they have not really forgiven. They have not really been set free from sin. They're still attached to that. All they have done is maybe loosen the rope a little bit that binds them to the sin, but they have not severed that rope and been freed from it. We are able to forgive. God has given us that ability, we just need to practice forgetting. Now some of us don't need a whole lot of practice forgetting. We are getting better and better at forgetfulness as the years go on. Sometimes I'll walk into a room, I forget why I walked into it. So my forgetter is getting better and better. We can use that gift of forgetting. When it comes to forgiving, others and forgiving ourselves. We can let go of sin. Third, let go of possessions. We have our annual stewardship emphasis coming up like all churches do in the fall. Some pastors dread uh, preaching about finances every autumn. Personally, I have never had any problem with it. My experience is that most people ignore whatever the pastor says about money anyway. <laughs> Jesus said a lot about money. They didn't take what he said seriously. So why should I think my experience would be any different? My experience is that people 
get all tied up in knots when it comes to money. Money destroys families and friendships. When an elderly parent dies, the grown kids will fight over the inheritance. And the money, which should have been and could have been a blessing, instead becomes a curse that damages that family. From doing marriage counseling, I know that finances is one of the biggest points of contention between husbands and wives. Friends will get all bent out of shape about money that is passed between them. If you want to put a stress on a relationship, just borrow a big sum of money from that person. That will change everything. This is true of property. Property lines seem to be a big deal to many people. And people get all upset over a few feet of dirt. Who cares about a few feet of dirt? And we're going to get a few feet of dirt in the cemetery when we die. People's lives, relationships, and happiness are all tied up with things and with money. Their sense of self-worth and happiness is tied to what they own. Jesus told story after story about such people. He said on one occasion, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed, for life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Paul says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. The advice of the New Testament is to let go. You've probably heard the old illustration of the monkey trap. The way that people used to catch monkeys in the wild was by taking a coconut and drilling a hole in it, carving it out, taking it out all liquid and everything, and have a hole in it just big enough for a monkey to be able to get his hand in, just like that. Then you, kind of, then you chain that, that uh, coconut to a tree. You put something inside of the coconut, some food or something, uh, that, that the monkey, monkey likes. The monkey will reach his hand in there, he'll you know, grab hold of that food, and try to withdraw his hand, but he can't do it as long as his, his fist is, is clenched like that. And it's said that the monkey will not let go. And even if a trapper comes up, they will not let go. And he, can be, he will be captured because it will not open up his fist and loosen up. Now, I've heard that story a lot. I'm not so sure that old story is true. I think monkeys probably are smarter than that. But I'm not so sure about human beings. My experience is that humans will not let go of things they need to let go of. Money, and possessions, and things like that. They're willing to give up an awful lot in order to keep a hold of things. Advice of scripture is to just let go. We can't take it with us anyway. As Jesus talks in the parable of the unjust steward, he said, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous man. It's a great lie. What he means by that is to use money and things to develop relationships rather than harm them. Fourth, let go of your life. The Apostle Paul talks about his death, his upcoming death, in our epistle lesson for today. He says, the time of my departure is at hand. And the, the Greek word, again, that he uses here for departure is a word for the casting off of the mooring lines of a ship as it sets out to sea. So it means to unloose, to untie a rope so the boat go on its way. That was the Apostle's understanding of the end of his physical life. The death is letting go. But we don't like to let go. Not when it comes to our death. In fact, we hold on to this physical life as long as we possibly can. And many people hold on for too long when they should no longer hold on to their loved ones or their own lives, using things like life support, that's what they call it, in, in the hospitals. Keeping a person's body alive even when, you know, consciousness is not there. In such cases, it almost seems to be like death denial rather than life support. <clears throat> Best thing we can do is to let go. We cannot hold on to these bodies forever. They say that every cell in the human body is replaced every seven years. That means we get a whole new body 
every seven years. I have to tell you, this new model I have is not any better than the one I had seven years ago. You know, if you're, if you're trading your cars every few years, you always get a better car. You don't trade down to a worse car. But when it comes to our bodies, we keep getting worse and worse and worse models every, every seven years. And we'll see that changing anytime, anytime soon. The cover story of Time Magazine on September 30th was on Google's attempt to solve death, they said, to cure death so that we could live forever. I don't think that would happen in my lifetime. If it did, I don't think I would want to buy into it. Who would want to physically live forever? We are not our physical bodies. To claim to them is to, to deny our true nature as children of God, born of the Spirit and not the flesh, is to trade our birthright for a mess of pottage like Esau did. People claim to physical life because they fear death. They, so we, we claim to what we know as long as we can, so we don't have to let go into the unknown. Jesus says, let go. Why worry about something that is inevitable? Why worry about something that we can't do anything about anyway? That is a waste of time. So let's, let's let go now, so that when the time comes, we can graciously let go of the body our earthly lives for good. As time approaches, we can face the inevitable with equanimity. Like the Apostle Paul, he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day. And not to me only, but to all who have loved his appearing. When we can let go of all, we gain all. But Jesus said, whoever seeks to save his life will lose it. He who loses his life for my sake will find it. Let's bow our heads for now. Heavenly Father, we confess to you that we do not follow the words of Jesus in the Sermon of the Mount. He instructs us to be not anxious and do not worry. But we confess, Lord, that there are times that we do worry and we are anxious, though we try not to be. Lord, we pray that we might be able to let go. You've given us our lives. You've given us everything in our lives. You've given every relationship we have in our lives to us. Lord, let us give it all back to you. Let us let go. Let us place ourselves in your hands and receive from you that perfect peace 